Well, Mark, here we are for another monthly roundup of questions from fans. Let's get straight into it. Yeah. What more can you tell us about the Andre Green operation? How was this not disclosed to us by Aston Villa or Andre beforehand? And are we covering the costs of the medical bills? There's a number of questions all rolled into one there, really, um, in regards of Andre. Um, what I'd like to say is just to reinforce what Kenny had said previously, a thorough medical was done um, with Andre. Full medical records were received from Aston Villa. Um, and I think it's fair to say that we was unaware that this particular cyst was going to cause an issue to Andre. Andre reported it to us after a game and said he, he really felt it, he felt the need that he, he wanted this cyst removed. Um, and obviously, you know, after liaising with Aston Villa club doctors and, and our own medical team, that is what we've decided to do. Now, my knowledge, I've obviously done a lot of work on this uh, in regards of cysts. Should a cyst be flagged up? Shouldn't it be flagged up? Um, apparently, you know, footballers, people generally, you know, have cysts quite consistently. If you scan them, cysts will show. It's just whether you know, they cause you any discomfort or, or any aggravation. Now, in the case of this particular cyst, um, obviously, Andre came in after a game, and to my knowledge, that was the first time that it had been flagged up that this was causing him discomfort, and we acted immediately on that. And in regards to the medical, um, I mean, under the terms of our contract, I mean, just so people are aware of how the medical, um, the payments work, um, we all, every club takes out an insurance policy with the, I think we're in the Premier League um, health scheme and, and basically at the end of the year you're, um, you, you, you don't pay for it on a case by case basis, the insurance covers it and then your premium is adjusted at the yeah. end of the year based on how many operations you've, you've had as a whole during that year. But my understanding is that will be on our insurance. Okay, right. A reoccurring thing is the quality of the iFollow feed, which we are well aware of. Yeah. Um, what can be done to ensure fans purchasing a match pass receive a guaranteed level of quality? And as an addition to that, do you support the EF EFL's decision to stream Saturday 3pm games to UK viewers on international weeks? So right, first part first. Yeah, let's, let's deal with the service issue qualities. C can we give a guarantee a service level? We genuinely can't. Um, just, just so everyone's clear with the, the iFollow service. The iFollow service um, is completely run by the EFL. So it's, it's run by the Football League. It's a Football League service that's done on behalf of, of individual club members. Yeah, so uh, I'm not trying to bail out of this because it's, if it wears the Pompey badge, then we are responsible for it. I know that. So, but just to give you the background to it, yeah. Um, generally, I think that if you go back just just over a year before I follow, it was listened to it on the radio, and I think the first year has been, you know, it has had its issued issues. It's something that the EFL are working on, and something that we are trying to assist them in working on to try and improve the service. How can you give a guaranteed service level? It's difficult because, as an example, Saturday. All the feedback I got from our owners, all the feedback I got from fans around the world that I stay in touch with and, and assess this was it, it was as good as it's ever been. You know, slight delay on the synchronisation of the commentary, but overall it was a really good service, enjoyable to watch it. And yet we still got complaints from other people. Now that can be an issue regarding their own internet bandwidth, their own computer performance, you know, interference in their house with other Wi-Fi networks. There's so many things that have got to be taken into account with that, that you, it's very difficult to give a minimum service level agreement other than we will always endeavour via the Football League to push for perfection mm. on the service. And we've discussed internally, do we, we listen, it's, it's fair to say we've had the discussions, do we pull the plug and just opt out of it? Mm. Yeah, let, let's be fair about it because we want we're perfectionists, we want to give the best service that we possibly can. I argued strongly that even on some of the, the weeks that it hasn't worked well, it's still better than listening to it yeah. on the radio. At least you see, you can see the video, if there's a delay, if there's a bit of stuttering, you know, that type of thing, then it, you know, that people will accept that over and above just listening to it on the radio. But we are striving for perfection in regards of someone saying, look, it is, but it was an absolute, disaster. I couldn't 
watch it, it was stuttering, and that has been a general occurrence, so it's not just individual people's problems, it's, a, it's been a service problem, then yeah, rightly go back to the Football League and you should be saying, look, this is unacceptable, can I have a refund? And they are looking at it, you know, and it will be on a case-by-case -case basis, but it will be based on their knowledge of how the service, the actual streaming, went out. We then roll on to the issue that we've not been public in this because we believe it's something that we should be discussing in the first instance privately. We have been strong advocates at the, the international I follow streaming live games internationally. Every game we think is a positive because that's people that can't or wouldn't normally be able to get to a live match, so it's not affecting really match day revenue. Tuesday nights, we're sort of 50-50, you know, a lot of fans and especially a lot of kids got school the next day, traveling large distances like the Bristol Rovers game as an example, can't get there, love to watch Pompey. Does it have a material impact on um, the gate attendances on a Tuesday night? We're quite happy for the Football League to, to carry on our personal opinion as a club that they can carry on trialling that. You know, let, let's look at that because I, the last thing we want to do is stop people having the opportunity to actually watch a game. Ideally, you want them to watch it in the flesh. Now, international break weekends, bank holidays, last game of the season potentially if it's outside of the um, blackout, are available to stream. The Football League want to trial it. We have stated privately, and I'm, I'm stating it publicly now as our position, that morally and principally we're against it. We, we don't want anything to impact 3 p.m. Saturday. There's no excuse. And with the greatest respect to fans that can't get there, you know, that would normally come, that it's Saturday at three o'clock. We know the time of the games, you know, it's traditional. We don't want to breach that. However, the one caveat we have discussed is in the event of a sellout, either home or away, so as if you use Wimbledon yeah. as an example where we'd probably be given a circa a thousand tickets and maybe four thousand want to go, do we tr do we deprive Pompey fans or even Wimbledon fans if it's sell out from their side of the ability to watch that game if it is available and outside of the international in, in comes falls within the international blackout time period. Mm. So that's what we really are exploring at the moment. We are having our discussions privately with the Football League but to reinforce morally in principle, principally, if it's a Saturday game that falls outside of the international black, blackout, so it's the international break weekend specifically, we, unless it's a sellout, we are absolutely opposed to that. We, we've touched on the rain, and of course, as we yeah. know, we all know the first deluge came last weekend. Yeah. It, it won't be the last. Yeah. Um, South Down Stand Roof seemingly has many leaks. Few comments from fans after last weekend's game, suggesting they got soaked. Equally, several about those at the front of the Fratton end getting soaked as well. Um, was what, if anything, can be done? Well, it's part of really, you know, the, the issues that we have got at Fratton Park Stadium as a whole needs extensive work, as we, we've always said. Um, if there's element, what I would encourage fans to do, if you are in a certain element of the ground, please email in where you sit, where you're getting, where the leak is, you know, and we will look at that. I mean, where I sit, it leaked, you know, it, it really does. It's just the decay, general decay of the stadium that some elements are maintenance and where it's maintenance, we can deal with it and we will be dealing with it. But the larger scale projects are just going to have to be done as we go around the stadium and hopefully address that over, over the next few years. The problem we've got is some areas of the roof, and I'll use all, all four stands, um, we can get at. It's safe to get it via ladders and, and via accessing it directly from the roof. Other areas, and we will try to address those. Other areas, it's not that easy to, to gain access. It's, it's completely unsafe, needs scaffolding, cherry picking, and that will just have to form part of the larger scale plans as we are gradually moving around the stadium, spending you know, more money and in investing in that particular stand, which, as you know, there's a, there's a program that we are working towards that hopefully should be starting next summer in that regard. OK. The pre-match through the years Portsmouth video is excellent, and most people say that. Yeah, yeah. But the song accompaniment skipped around all over the place and didn't play properly again last Saturday. What is being done to address this? And again, we obviously are aware of it. Yeah, it's, I think we put a statement out a few weeks ago to clarify that 
I mean, we behind the scenes, we're doing everything. I mean, it's, it's taken up so much time, and, and rightly so, because the whole pre-match, half-time, everything works perfectly well now during the game. It's just for some reason, them last two videos, um, we seem to have issues with, we play that video 10 times a day, every day, yeah. in the lead up to a game, and it works perfectly. It's just in them final five, 10 minutes before a game, that one, and to a lesser degree, extent the one before the Pirates of the Caribbean one, it just seems to, to, to stutter. We, 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 are, we are not sure if, if it's an Im embedded video stroke audio stream issue, then, you know, you would think that would show up half an hour before the game, and it doesn't because we're, we're playing videos, you know, offset, and there's no stuttering, there's no, it's working perfectly. So is it a power issue? Is it an interference issue? We just don't know. Now we did trial it a couple of weeks ago, um, running the video and the audio separately, and that worked. So, and, the, and yet in the interim, we've now had a fiber connected from the control tower up to the screen, so we hope that would solve the problem. But the only way of actually finding out in a real life situation is just prior to kickoff in, in a, you know, a real life experiment. And that's what we've done. It did stutter again, you know, it's embarrassing for me personally because I stand there and I like to clap along like everyone else and so you do for all the good work that's gone into it it just sort of gets unraveled in that that little spell so we are addressing it I think we'll end up coming to the conclusion that look until we're hundred percent guaranteed we know it's going to work and I don't know how we're going to arrive at that situation bearing in mind the only way to find out is the five minutes before the kickoff to a game but we'll probably revert back in the short term to actually playing the um, the, the soundtrack separate from the video so that the soundtrack runs true. We should end by saying though that the Portsmouth video is a wonderful montage of 120 years history all in two minutes. It, it, I think it's fantastic, I think it sums up Portsmouth as a whole, you know the historic element, you know the our history in regards of the war, you know, the, the football side, it just brings it, the, the iconic now in regards of the Spinnaker Tower, you know, all that just brings it all together. And I, I think, yeah, it was a great piece of production um, and, it, and the fans love it. Mike Trabilco scoring against Arsenal is mine. Is that your favourite? Yeah, that's it, that's it. <laughs> OK, what are the current plans or feasible options for the slowly but surely demising of the Milton End? Um, I think Michael said it in his address to the PST AGM um, last week that that will be the first area of the stadium that we are really looking at. Um, so in its demise, we're hoping there's, there's planning currently underway uh, of how we can maximise both in terms of um, capacity in the Milton End, bringing it up to scratch in regards of services, you know, the toilets, the, the retail offering there and that. So um, that's currently in planning stage. So it, as you say, it, it, it a, the, the person that wrote in said there that we can't allow it, it's just going, it's, it's not a great stand, it needs looking at, and it, it will be probably the first area of the stadium that is really looked at significantly in regards of um, either upgrading or completely new, yeah. Amongst a lot of little bugbears, is that the main bugbear, the Milton End? No, I, I think that the Milton End is, is definitely our most, um, is the stand that's requiring the most attention. I mean, the toilet facilities are poor, yeah. the um, kiosk facilities are poor, there's just no space there, you know, there's no, f to, to do anything really. Um, just the, the stand as a whole is well below standard, we know that, and it's something that is currently in planning phase to look to be addressed as soon as possible. Okay. A lack of space between rows in the north stand upper, which is not ideal for people over six feet who require extra leg room. Can anything be done? And I guess that could have come from the south stand upper or anywhere it can else. come to any, I mean, the standards generally over the years have improved. Um, if you look at all the new stadiums, the, the pitch, not in, as in regards of the actual pitch the players play on, but the pitch of the seats and the gap between the seats, industry standards are, are a lot higher now. And as part of looking at the stadium of a whole, that will be addressed throughout all areas of the stadium. So it's just not exclusively to the North Stand Up. Okay. But I can't uh, give a time to go on it, but it is no, being no, looked at and we no. are aware of it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, we've addressed the PA system. So complaints about slow service at kiosks. 
it's still all reoccurring problems which suggest there's something bigger behind it all. Well, I, th I think we've said, you know, we, we revisit this once every six months to a year on the, on the Q&As that the, generally, we, we had a survey done when we first came out of administration um, and it basically says that our kiosks, the square f meterage of them, there's enough square meterage to cater for 10,000 people in the stadium. In, in, so if you was going to build a new stadium, the, s the square meterage that aligns with the capacity would, would be for 10,000 people. So we are regularly getting 16 to 18,000 turn up actually attend. So it's going to be tough. There's, yeah. there's no real easy way. I mean, we're looking at other kiosks, fast, poor, separately. Um, you know, we set the, the beer barrels up and just to just for, for beers, we're trying to alleviate that pressure, but ultimately it is down to facilities. And again, part of the main overall moving forward and how we look at the stadium and how do we improve it moving forward, that is a, a key part of the planning. As a chief executive, you must be delighted with the start of the season. Yeah, we, I think at our last Q&A we said, how long is it gonna go on for? Well, another month's gone yeah. by and it's still an unbeaten record. Um, disappointed, obviously, probably the last two home games in, in not getting maximum points. But I think the longer we keep the unbeaten run going, whether that be wins or draws, um, I think it will keep us, solidify us in that upper two, three, four, five, six places, whatever it may be. Um, but we've got, a, I know it's an old cliche, we've got to keep our feet firmly on the ground and, and generally take every game as it comes, one game at a time, Big game Saturday against Rochdale. Big game as well, Tuesday, Coventry away. Let's just try and keep hold of that record as long as we can and, and pick up as many points as we can while we're on that run. All the time you've got it though, it does add pressure, doesn't it? Because people actually now get disappointed with draws. <laughs> yeah, I think it's always disappointing when you concede a late goal, um, as, as we did on mm. Saturday. And funny enough, it, you know, we, we discussed it and I said it as soon as I come in the ballroom after the game, it felt like a loss. And you sort of had to wake yourself up that it was, wasn't a loss, it was a draw. So, uh, yeah, but you're right, the expectation levels are, have gone up. As I said pre-season, you know, I, I don't know where we're going to finish this year. I know where I hope we finish. But I do think that generally we have got a real depth in our squad this year. And, and listen, at some point, you don't want to wish it, but we will probably get beat. The law of averages says mm. that you will get beat. And then the next big test will be how do we bounce back from that, you know? And all I can say is it's a great team spirit. We've got great managers, got great players. We've got great players that are currently not, in, not getting in the squad, you know? And, you know, maybe a loss will open up opportunities for those. But while we're on this run, you know, you just keep nurturing it along, doing what we can. And, and you know, the fans have been absolutely fantastic as always in supporting that. But the general trend of improvement from League Two struggling to League Two champions to League One sort of just below the playoffs to where you are now. It just keeps continuing, doesn't it? In six years, if you take our league position now, which is like the six years since we come out of admin, we've only regressed once in our league position. So it has been a steady upward. All right, we've had one year where it dipped a bit, but it's, it's generally just kept going up. Now, how long can that go? Well, that's what Michael has said consistently, steady, slow process. What you don't want is, you, listen, you wouldn't turn it down. You don't want that one year where you go, crazy like that and then there's only really one way you can start going after that yeah we just want it steady strong foundations as we've always talked about and on and off the pitch you know commercially in regards of attendances we've had a little blip along the way but all the key factors just keep steadily going up you know as we go on about it we do want to be known as the hardest working football club in the world um, I think that you know for a club to work much harder than us, you know. Uh, I'd like to see one because I know how hard we work, how you work, Dan works, Ollie. This whole club is built on the fact that we do work hard. It's something we want to build in. I think our current group of players and, and Kenny as manager and his backroom team, you know, fit that ethos perfectly. They leave no stone unturned. They work hard at everything they do. Um, and, and overall, we work in the best interests of the football club. And, you know, and I think we've got that ethos on and off the pitch, and it's something that we will keep working on. And, but that's not to say we won't have a dip along the way for a season. We probably will. Law of averages said we probably will. But overall, as long as we keep going up over, if it's not just one year at a time, it's a three-year period, it's something that we will keep doing. Um, slow and methodical, as Michael said. And three nominations for business awards would, would seem to 
suggest it's being recognised. Yeah, and, and the, I think the pleasing thing in, thing in all three categories are our relationship with the fans, which was one of the big concerns of of coming out of fan ownership into private ownership was, well, we had this fantastic relationship between, you know, the board, all elements, the, the, the executive, people that work at the club and the fans. We had that unique bond. Mm. Was we going to lose that under new private ownership? And thankfully, and it's been recognised by three individual walls, that says to me that, wow, not only have we carried on with that great work, we've actually enhanced it. And for people that don't know, the FC Business Awards are the industry recognised best awards that you, you can um, win. And listen, we haven't won them, but we are finalists in three yeah, yeah. separate categories, but all aligned directly and indirectly to fan interaction. So that's something as chief exec I'm really proud of. I know Michael's really proud of it, but ultimately the staff, yourself, everyone associated with the club and the supporters, we should be proud of it as a club. Mm. I'm sure we are.